Welcome to Wealthy Living Conversation. I'm Lisa, your host and founder of Wealthy Living. It is here that I connect with a variety of people to have inspiring and insightful conversations to help you live a meaningful, a connected and a well life both personally and professionally. So today it is an absolute pleasure and privilege to be chatting with a truly inspirational and a a magnificent change maker. He's the Executive Director of Australia's National Sustainable Food Systems Organisation, Sustain. Nick Rose is his name and I'll welcome him in a minute. Um, In this episode, we'll have the opportunity to learn from Nick's extensive knowledge and experience about food systems. We'll discuss the significance of urban agriculture and he'll share some findings from his latest project, the Pandemic Gardening Survey. But before I get into this, I just want to tell you a little bit about Nick's formal education and experience. So Nick holds a bachelor degree in law, a master's in community and international development, a PhD in political ecology, a Churchill Fellowship. He's the editor of Fair Food, Stories from Movement Changing the World, a co-editor of Reclaiming Urban, the Urban Commons, The Past, Present and Future of Food Growing in Australian Towns and Cities. He's also an lecturer in food studies, food systems and food food movement at William Anglis Institute in Melbourne. Nick brings more than a decade of working at grassroots and institutional levels in several Australian states in food sovereignty and sustainable food systems. He believes in the power of relationships and networks to move mountains, transform societies and change the course of history. Nick's goal is to work collaboratively with individuals and organisations who share the vision of fair, sustainable and resilient food systems. So welcome, Nick. Uh, Hi, Lisa. Thanks very much uh, for this opportunity. Great to be with you and your listeners. Oh, pleasure. It's, you know, it's our pleasure, I mean, and the listeners to have you here today with your vast knowledge and experience that you can share. So, you know, you're such an incredible facilitator of change. And, you know, I'm just wondering, like, why food systems? Like, was there a point in your life where, you know, you came to this decision? Or is there a reason that moved you to be so passionate in this area? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. I guess it's really interesting for everybody who's involved in uh, processes of social change, whoever they may be and wherever they are, like what actually brought them to that point. And, and I, I guess for me, you know, I look back and I think everything that I've done, um, everything that I've learned has kind of brought me to where I am today and prepared me for the work that I'm doing right now. But if there was a particular moment in time uh, where I made a decision that really kind of put me on this course. I would say it was being living in, in England. I was living in London for a number of years in the 1990s and then made a decision to go and live in Guatemala and Central America and get involved in direct human rights action, um, a form of direct human rights action called uh, human rights observation or human rights accompaniment. And to, that was with an organisation called Peace Brigades International that was set up in Spain in the mid-1980s. So uh, my former partner and I made the decision to leave our life in England, uh, to go and live in Guatemala, to learn Spanish. And then it was that experience really of, of living for the first time in a, uh, a country of the global south, in Guatemala, understanding the history and the uh, challenges uh, that that country had experienced uh, over over uh, you know half a century from the, the 1950s to the early 2000s when we arrived there in the early 2000s, uh, the country had just come out of uh, nearly 40 years of internal armed conflict, which left a, a, a devastating toll of human suffering. And it was through conversations, uh, reading, uh, that I came to understand that so much of that had to do with food and agriculture and questions of land ownership and what kind of food was being produced and who was benefiting 
from the production of that food and conversely who was not benefiting and how that translated into uh, you know uh, infant mortality to to childhood malnutrition uh, you know hunger and poverty all those kinds of issues came back to questions about the food system and, and land ownership and I guess that was really a light bulb moment for me um, that, that set me on the path that I'm on today. I went back and, and did the study that you mentioned, the, the master's degree through Deakin University whilst living for several years in Guatemala, uh, working with uh, human rights organisations, with farmer organisations, with indigenous peoples organisations, uh, gaining some insight into, into the challenges they were facing, their realities, and, you know, their courage and, and resilience in the face of you know, such profound uh, difficulty and suffering that they've endured, um, but nevertheless continuing to, um, you know, to carry on and, and to strive for, you know, for, for a better uh, quality of life, um, you know, to strive for justice for, the, for their communities. Um, you know, really made me realise, I guess, that somebody in my position with the, you know, the privileges that I had, that I have, um, made me feel a, a sense of responsibility to, um, you know, dedicate my capabilities, um, my resources to, to try and uh, make a difference in the world, to, to, to bring about the changes that, that I was able. Um, and then realising that I, I should really probably do that in my own country, in Australia, um, uh, and, and then making the decision to come back to Australia in, at the end of 2006. Um, and since that time, really, you know, my, my efforts and my research have, have really been all around, uh, around food systems, understanding that if we think about the big challenges that we're facing, the crises that we're facing right now, you know, so many of them come back to the way we're managing our land, um, the, the way, the kind of foods we're eating, you know, what's going into that food, the, the levels of understanding about that. Um, you know, so much of the, you know, we talk about climate change, talk about public health crises, talk about biodiversity loss, you know, so much of this comes back to, to food and agriculture. And that's, I guess, the bad news. But the good news is, if we can start making changes in those systems, then, you know, we have a chance to a, a, a much better, you know, more sustainable, uh, fairer uh, future across, you know, all of all of uh, our society. So that's yeah, that's really why I, I've decided to to concentrate my work uh, around food and around food systems. Yeah, brilliant. You know, it's so it's so amazing, isn't it? How it you takes going sometimes to such poor countries um, who have such limited resources and um, and somewhat poor infrastructure and yet they're the countries that we learn the most from and we see we get so inspired by you know due to seeing how incredible they work together and the resilience that they have and really working what they've with what they've got and keeping things you know really simple and you know that farm to plate sort of culture that a lot of the third world countries have and you know it's incredible how we live in this um Western culture, which has so much more um, funding and um, and education, yet it is those countries that we really seem to learn so much from. Yes, yes, that's that's right, um, and also, yeah, the the their courage and bravery, I guess, mm -hmm. is something that's really stayed with me. I remember meeting um, uh, an indigenous rights leader. Uh, um, Berta Cáceres, her name was, uh, Berta Oliva rather, um, uh, from Honduras of the Lenca peoples in northern Honduras and there's a, a little documentary on YouTube um, that's been made about her called The Mother of, the Mother of All Rivers, uh, La Madre de, de Todos los Rios and it's really um, about her, uh, her the, the campaign that she led uh, her people in um, uh, resisting the damming uh, of, of, of a river that was very important to them for ancestral reasons but also in terms of access to water and, and fishing and, and basic food security and there was a proposal from the Honduran government and a, a company to put a dam on that river that would have uh, severely impacted um, 
you know, those communities in, in, in a very major way. And she, you know, put her, um, her life on the line quite literally in an environmental campaign to, uh, to resist that and paid the ultimate price very sadly. Um, you know, she was successful and, you know, the, the, the mobilizations that they organized were successful in getting that decision reversed to dam the river. Um, but then sadly, some months after that concluded, um, she was, you know, um, you know, uh, masked gunman broke into her house in the middle of the night and, mm. and assassinated her. Um, and, and she, she paid, you know, she paid the ultimate price for, Standing up for the rights of her people um, and the the basic source of nourishment and life, which is water, mm-hmm. um, and that's you know unfortunately that's the reality that that people are facing in those countries. So um, you know whenever things seem kind of challenging and, and difficult for me um, in in my kind of little world here, um, I you know just just think back to mm. um, to those sacrifices of, of women like her and and um, their courage and bravery and, and remind myself that, uh, you know, um, yeah, I have so much to be thankful for and grateful for and, and such a responsibility to, to, you know, use the position that I have to, to try to, you know, to advocate um, for change. Um, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, um, yeah, people like her are a real source of inspiration uh, for me whenever I'm feeling a little bit, you know, down or, or depressed or that things are hopeless or, or too big or, I, you know, what's the point? Um, uh, you know, there's, um, you know, her story is one of, of dozens, if not hundreds of, of women and men around the world who've, um, you know, who've made that sacrifice for, you know, for the dignity and, and rights of their people. So, yeah. Um, you know, I just need to just, you know, think about that and reflect on that and it's, um, uh, it's, really kind of all the inspiration I need to, to keep doing what I'm what I'm doing. Yeah, and that inspiration has a ripple effect because you're inspired by her, but so many people are inspired by you, Nick, and the incredible work that you do and the teams that you lead and the people that you collaborate with to bring about such incredible change for us um, locally. So, um, yeah, that inspiration definitely has a ripple effect. Um, I want to... I want to talk to you about another experience that you've had, and that was in 2014, where one in around 100 people in Australia awarded are awarded a Churchill Fellowship, and you were one of those people. I'm wondering if you can just tell the people that are listening today, like, what is a Churchill Fellowship, and what research project were you involved with? And then the third thing, maybe, if you can just share some of the lessons that you were able to bring back to benefit the Australian community. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Um, so a Churchill Fellowship is a, a really unique and amazing opportunity that the Churchill Foundation of Australia, uh, which was established many years ago now, uh, provides to, yeah, like you say, a, a small number of um, fortunate Australians, and I was one of them, I am one of them, uh, to go and do a dedicated period of travel and study overseas. And the idea of it is that it's in a fear of uh, social or community life in Australia that is, you know, has benefits for the broader community and you as a Churchill Fellow, your, your role, your responsibility with the funding that they provide is to go to a select number of countries and to uh, have a, a project that you've developed to investigate, uh, to uh, understand, you know, what organisations and individuals are doing in that particular area of uh, social and community life that um, they're doing, you know, in innovative and creative and impactful ways that are perhaps not being done in that way in Australia, but that we could learn from. And your role is then to go and meet those people to learn about what they're doing and bring back those lessons and hopefully to apply them in Australia and see how we could uh, learn from what's been what's happening overseas, bring that back to Australia, adapt it and apply it for the benefit of the Australian community. So that's the that's the idea of a Churchill Fellowship. So my Churchill Fellowship was to investigate innovative models of urban agriculture. And I went to the Midwest region of the United States, to Chicago, to Milwaukee, Detroit. I then went to Toronto in Canada, and then I went to five provinces in Argentina in 2014. And 
the reason I did that is because I'd been involved in some research in Melbourne uh, a couple of years before that in 2012 through something called the National Climate Change Adaptation Research Facility, which uh, was funding different pieces of research to look at how uh, we needed to make adjustments in Australia in order to adapt to the challenges of, uh, of climate change. And this particular research project was looking at the role of urban agriculture, of food growing in Australian towns and cities, and how that could help us um, uh, both mitigate and adapt to the challenges of climate change and enhance levels of food security and urban resilience. And so I uh, was part of the team that uh, looked at Melbourne as a case study at that time. And my conclusions from that research were that there was a lot of you know, a lot of community gardening happening in Australia, um, but that not a lot of it was really directed to the goal of food security in terms of actually growing food for people um, in vulnerable circumstances who needed access to food. And nor was a lot of it about creating, um, you know, livelihood opportunities, uh, opportunities for small businesses, employment, those kinds of things. So those were the two things that I was particularly interested to go to the United States and Toronto and Argentina to learn about. Um, and yeah, it was fantastic. I was away for a couple of months, um, you know, met over 150 people, I think, in about 90 different projects and organizations. Um, yeah, m amazing, creative, innovative, energetic people, um, you know, working in challenging situations and making the most of their resources and uh, opportunities they had to do you know, pretty amazing things with, with you know, with um, urban spaces to to grow food and create, um, you know, really fantastic, impactful urban agriculture projects. So, yeah, since since that time, I've really kind of been on a bit of a mission personally and through my work with Sustain to promote the cause of urban agriculture in Australia, to promote the understanding that it has so many benefits. Um, both in terms of food security, in expanding access to healthy and nutritious food, in terms of food literacy, working with children, with young people, in terms of understanding, you know, how food is produced and where it comes from and the, the benefits from eating, you know, vegetables and, and fresh food, um, to the psychological benefits and mental health benefits of, uh, of growing food and spending time in nature and spending time in the, in the garden. Um, to the community strengthening and connecting aspects of initiatives like um, uh, urban farming and, and community gardening, um, to training and employment and small business opportunities that uh, these projects enable. So there's, you know, there's so many, there's so many benefits. It's so multifunctional. Um, I think in Australia, the understanding around that has been quite limited. That local government sort of thinks of it really just through the lens of community gardens only without kind of grasping all these other dimensions and potentials. So I think we're really here just kind of starting to scratch the surface. But all of this has become, you know, a lot more relevant and important this year in particular in 2020 with the impact of the COVID um, uh, pandemic and the, you know, the lockdowns and the restrictions that we've all been under. Um, you know, the, the impacts that's had in terms of uh, a big rise in demand for uh, food security agencies for emergency food relief um, and also the impacts of isolation you know the the increase in reports about people feeling anxious people feeling worried um, you know depressed uh, lonely all these kinds of things um, you know and the role that uh, you know spending time in the garden having access to that space can play in you know mitigating some of those impacts as well as making people feel better about themselves and feel happier and, and more relaxed. Um, so yeah, I think uh, the COVID, you know, one of the potential silver linings of the COVID situation has been, you know, the, the realization that it has created among large numbers of us um, in terms of, you know, what matters and what's important and what's fundamental in life, as well as at a kind of policy level at local and state government realizing that um, our food system is not as you know secure and stable as had been assumed and that we need to be um, 
uh, yeah, enabling uh, more uh, more food growing to take place in in more spaces, and that urban agriculture has a really important role to play uh, in that. So. Um, yeah, so that was like a really important moment for me, that Churchill Fellowship, and it's been very formative um, uh, in the work that I've been doing, you know, ever since really um, with Sustain. Yeah, brilliant. And do you think like from the time that you finished the fellowship, and I want to talk a little bit more about what you just started to talk about then, you know, the post-COVID opportunity um, that has been identified with, you know, the last couple of months, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but do you think that the that coming back and realising all those things from your fellowship and seeing the gap that we've got here, it's been, you know, what, between 2014 um, and, you know, 20, 26 years. Have you seen much, like you've come back with all of these ideas and inspiration and you've run an extremely amazing um, business, Sustain, um, where you have a lot of, um, a bit, you know, a team of people, on this same mission, collaborating with other organisations on a sim with similar goals. Have you seen much progression in the last six years with the government actually hearing the need? Yeah, um, probably I uh, would say definitely not at the federal government level. Um, there hasn't been much movement there. Um, there is starting to be a little bit of movement, you know, just lately at the state government level in Victoria, but that's that's been, you know, um, slow. Where I think there has been significant movement at government level has been at the local government level, local council level. And I can name a number of councils in Melbourne and Victoria that have got specific food strategies and food policies. Um, and one of the aims of those is to encourage people to grow some of their own food. So, um, you know, the, the city of Yarra, which is you know, Fitzroy and Carlton, um, those Collingwood, uh, they've got a, an urban agriculture strategy. They've had that in place for a number of years now. Um, the city of Moreland, which is Brunswick and um, Brunswick and Coburg, uh, they've got a food system strategy that has been in place since 2017. They've got a food systems officer. Um, they work closely with the Moreland Food Gardens Network and you know, there's a whole kind of program of work supporting people in that council area to uh, to grow more of their own food. The city of Darabin mm -hmm. um, has a urban food strategy and a climate emergency strategy. Uh, and again, a strong aspect of that is about urban food gardening. They've got a Darabin Backyard Gardeners mm -hmm. Network and a local Backyard Harvest Festival um, that they've been promoting since uh, about 2014-15 that they're continuing with now and wanting to increase. Uh, Cardinia Shire Council, uh, a bit further out, around Pakenham, officer that way. Uh, we've been working with them since 2016. Uh, with our um, facilitation, they created a community food strategy in 2018. Uh, so they're, you know, very active uh, and involved in this area. And then there's um, on the other side of Melbourne, we have Surf Coast Shire, which also has a food strategy um, dating to 2018-19, and the city of Greater Bendigo, uh, which has a food system strategy, which their council endorsed uh, just this year in 2020. And a key plank of that is uh, supporting edible gardening yeah. uh, and increasing edible gardening. So there's you know, a, been a, a, a significant increase um, uh, in activity and it's becoming uh, embedded in council policies and strategies in a number of different areas in Victoria. Brilliant. And is it is it is there a big difference in the impact that we can have if we keep it at a local um, council level, or if it, or do you feel that it's necessary for it to be at a a state or a national um, government level, or is this something that can have great impact by people getting um, involved with their local community programs? Yeah, look, you know, and then alongside, I mean, that's, I've just mentioned things happening at the local government level. I mean, alongside that, um, you know, uh, Australians in their own communities, in their own spaces have been, you know, many of them have been doing this for a long period of time. Um, you know, there's the whole permaculture movement that's been around, you know, since the late 1970s with Bill Mollison and David Holmgren. And, uh, 
a couple of years ago, David Holmgren published his Retro Suburbia book, which uh, some of your listeners might be familiar with, which is a great kind of resource that profiles, yeah. you know, dozens of Australians all over the country who've been turning their back gardens into mini urban farms and urban food forests and growing, you know, significant amounts of their own food in small spaces um, and, and sharing you know, the techniques about how they do that. So that's all been underway, you know, for, for a long period of time. Um, so absolutely, you know, people, and that's one of the great things about working in this area that, you know, you don't have to ask anybody's permission to go and, you know, grow some food in, in your own space um, and connect with others who are doing the same. Um, you know, it's a, it's a great, you know, there's so many different entry points um, into, into the world of, of food and food systems. At the same time, in terms of impact and scale and the changes that we need to make, um, I do think government has to be involved and I think government at all levels needs to be involved. So it's great that local governments and some of them, you know, are getting seriously involved and, and engaged with this. Uh, however, more needs to happen and it needs to happen not just at the local government level, it also needs to happen at the state government level and at the federal level. Um, uh, one of the, you know, the, the, the challenges that people face, um, uh, particularly, you know, in the inner Melbourne context, if you're living in townhouses or apartments, is space. You know, you can't grow food if you don't have space to do it. Yes, you can, you know, grow some pots of herbs on a balcony or a little courtyard, but if you're actually wanting to, you know, go and grow some potatoes or garlic or, you know, whatever, you, you need, some, need some space. You know, a lot of us have back gardens, but then a lot of us don't. So clearly there's a role for government and also private sector actors as well, you know, developers. I think the development industry has a role here as well in thinking about, um, you know, the land that they manage and control and who has access to that and how and how they can, you know, play an important role in facilitating access to, to land, even if it's only for, a, you know, a few years while they're kind of working out how they're going to build apartments and those kind of things. Um, you know, I'm 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 one of the beneficiaries of working with a developer um, uh, who's you know doing exactly that. They've, they've got land that they're going to build townhouses on, but because of the economic climate at the moment, they're not built, you know beginning construction for some time. So we've been part of a little community garden. We thought it was only going to be for a year um, with some wicking beds, and we've been there three years, and they still haven't commenced building. And then meanwhile, we've you know harvested you know, um, probably hundreds of kilos of food in that, in that times. And there's so many, you know, spaces in Melbourne like that, that are just empty, empty blocks of land sitting behind cyclone fences, growing weeds in concrete that could be, you know, um, with a little bit of, you know, coordination and facilitation, a bit of resourcing could be opened up as spaces for people to grow food. So, um, uh, councils, developers, uh, state government in terms of resourcing um, and giving, you know, strategic sort of like focus and coordination and saying that this is important and uh, it should be, um, you know, it should be something that should be encouraged and enabled and we're going to help people to do that. And, and you know, happily at this time with the state government dealing with the crisis that we're in, um, you know, there are people inside the state government in different departments that are, that are beginning to realise that and creating uh, programs to uh, you know enable community members uh, to do these kinds of things. So yeah, that's, um, yeah, it's, it's good to see it's good to see some change starting to starting to happen at that level as well. Absolutely, and you know it's these things as you know most people know that work in any public health area. You know these things don't happen overnight, and there is a you know quite a quite a lengthy process, unfortunately, for it to have. Um, you know, to see some significant change and some acceptance from different levels of people in power that um, allow those changes to take place. But if people are listening today and they're inspired by um, what you're trying to do, so, you know, they think it's a fantastic idea, even listening to you talk about um, apartment buildings, I'm thinking about, wow, you know, if it was in an apartment building, they could use even the rooftop as, you know, and that could rooftop gardens that you know sustain that building um and i don't know if that's actually a possibility but you know there's different ideas that come to mind when you speak and i'm sure for other people listening there might be ideas or they might want to get involved somehow is this something that can be done on that individual level um obviously people can 
you know, start their own little gardens? Um, or is it something that needs to be done at a bigger community and state and national level and by organisations such as yourself? Oh, no. I mean, I think, uh, I think uh, people can come together, you know, as I said, like individuals in your own space. Um, you can, you know, you can, you can start growing um, food yourself. And a lot of people have done that during the COVID um, pandemic. Um, but I think, and we, we've done some survey research about this, which I might sort of touch on in a moment. Um, people need support, you know, if you're doing this for the first time, you know, um, it, it seems simple, but there's a lot of kind of like, you know, traps for the, you know, for the novice, I guess, uh, in terms of what to grow and how to do it and all that kind of Live. stuff. So, sorry? I can't keep plants alive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, a lot of people are in the same boat. So, um, and that can be kind of discouraging if you sort of like, you want to grow some food and, and you, you try and it's, um, it doesn't work out, you can easily be discouraged. So there's yeah. a real need for um, mentoring and guidance and support. And there's, you know, some great resources that? online. There is, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of kind of networks and things, but it's, it's, you kind of need to know where to look and who to connect with and, and how to make those, you know, uh, connections. So, um, so where um, fun, you know, like there are kind of... Someone could go, like if they're listening now and they go, yeah, and I want to look something up, where's something that they could look up? Um, so there's a great national festival that's happening at the moment called Grow It Local, um, which could be, you know, some, someone else that you might want to feature on your podcast. I'm sure they'd be happy to. They're doing a, a whole kind of, spring festival at the moment on exactly this on on you know people growing food in their own spaces and and celebrating and promoting that uh so yeah grow it local they've got a you know a whole kind of website with a, a map around the country of um you know of, of edible gardening patches and and people who can um who you can connect with um with community gardens there's community gardens australia that's got a directory of community gardens uh right around the country um and if you did, a, 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 sorry if you did want to like you said before if you saw happen to see that this block of land is near you in your neighborhood and has been empty for ages and you can see nothing's happening who would someone go to if they wanted to think about starting a community garden in that plot of land yeah so a good local group in melbourne would be three thousand acres uh three thousand acres.org uh they um uh, they were set up a few years ago now to facilitate the establishment of community gardens. Um, so they'd, they'd certainly um, be a good sort of like resource um, first port of call to go and have a chat about it and what the you know what the process might be in terms of um, identifying who the owner of that land is and asking permission and you know all those kinds of questions that would need to be thought through. So. Yeah, if you're talking about, you know, collective gardening and community gardening, it does, yeah, there's more work that's involved because it's, um, you know, you're talking about, you know, managing space, managing land, you're talking about questions of insurance and, you know, liability and water and access and and then how you organise yourself as a group and, and, you know, managing relationships and all those kinds of things. So it's a fantastic thing to do, but, yeah, it does require, you know, some you know, some, some organisation and coordination and structures around it. So but there are organisations that are established to, to, you know, support groups to do that. Um, but uh, again, it's um, local government also have resources. So depending, you know, which, which council area you're in, um, they will often have open space managers and they will be able to kind of tell you who owns the land and they might have their own kind of community gardens policy uh, around that and, and somebody in council that can explain to you what the different steps and processes are that you need to, you know, you need to look at in terms of how you get organised and, and look at accessing that land. Yeah, brilliant. That, they're great tips and I'll put all of those resources on the show notes so that the links are there for people that can follow up if they're interested. Um, so you've done a lot of stuff around food sovereignty and sustainable food systems. Can you explain what this actually means? Sure. So the food system, the simplest way to think about it is everything that happens from, um, you know, from farm to fork, um, uh, from soil to stomach, you know, how do, we, how do we actually, you know, feed ourselves every day? So it's as, it's as simple and as complicated as that, right? So 
you know, all of us have to eat, so it's absolutely fundamental, you know, to um, you know, to to our health and well-being in our society. We all have to eat, uh, hopefully three times a day. Hopefully, we can eat well. Um, you know, we are what we eat. Um, you know, our diets, uh, our food habits. Um, you know, a, a reflection of our culture, um, our um, enjoyment, and and ultimately kind of express themselves in terms of our health and well-being. But you know, what we eat as individuals, what we eat as a society, then kind of like you know, flows back down through everything that happens um, from us as consumers, as eaters, uh, back to, you know, through the, the whole sort of chains and processes of of, of, uh, of the food system. So we're talking about transport, we're talking about, you know, storage, warehousing, logistics, um, you know, food manufacturing and processing, and then, of course, back to farms and, and uh, you know, food growing and, and how that takes place. So... Um, you know, it's this big sort of complex web. Uh, I think it's good to think of it as a as a cycle, as um, you know, as a, as a network, as uh, you know, interconnected um, you know webs of relationships um, uh, that, that 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 go together to producing uh, the food that we you know end up sort of consuming each day. Um, so it has massive impacts, and that's what I was saying to you before, in terms of why I've chosen to kind of like focus my work in this area. Somebody who's interested in in social change and a better and fairer society um, and and better Australia. It has massive impacts, um, and one example of that I don't know. Some of you listeners might have um, heard of the Fight for Planet A series that ABC featured over the last uh, couple of weeks with Craig Rucastle, and the last in that series was on food security. Um, and people can go to you know ABC iView and, and have a look at that. Um, he was looking at the um, challenges facing uh, agriculture and the food system in Australia, and and one of the really um, graphic um, uh, scenes in that uh, in that documentary that came out at the end of August, or uh, yeah, it was the end of August, um, was uh, looking at what's happening in Queensland. Uh, with land clearing and linked to the beef cattle industry of northern Australia, um, and it's absolutely um, uh, you know shocking uh, statistics. And I haven't got the exact numbers here right now, but it's um, it's hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of hectares being cleared um, every year, and it works out. Um, I think they were saying it works out to be. Um, uh, the two and a half MC, the equivalent area of land of 2.5 MCGs being cleared uh, every, I think it's every hour. I think that might be right. I have to go and check to, to be quite sure. But, you know, um, every hour of every day of every week of every month um, over wow. the last couple of years, of, of trees being ripped out of the ground. And I went there in 2015. I saw how they do it. You can watch it on the show. They have this massive great chain that's connected to two tractors and they're just ripping out trees. You know, it, it's brutal and, and violent. Um, ripping out trees to, you know, to, to then run um, beef cattle on. Um, uh, you know, extraordinary impacts in terms of um, uh, release of carbon, stored carbon in the soil, and contributing to climate change phenomenon, and destruction of habitat. Um, you know, massive destruction of habitat for native fauna and uh, um, and insects. So, you know, Australia's got the you know unfortunate distinction of being one of the um, deforestation hotspots in the world. Um, you know, we're up there with Amazon clearing, and this is why. Um, you know, this is the reason why we are in that uh, in that classification, and also in terms of biodiversity loss and species loss. Um, so that's you know we're talking about you know food systems. These are the impacts that the food system is having. Another one is um, our health and well-being. So um, talking about again the role of state government in this area. Uh, the biggest cause of um, disease and early death in Australia right now is no longer tobacco and alcohol. It's now diet. It's the food that we're eating. And so much of it comes back to um, consuming too much, um, you know, fast food and sugar-sweetened beverages. Um, and the reason we're doing that, um, uh, you know, obviously it's, Everybody kind of like, you know, choosing to go and, and, and patronise those establishments. But 
that takes place in um, in environments uh, such as Pakenham, where we work, where according to Deakin University research that came out earlier this year, it's now what they call a food swamp. And what they mean by that is that that suburb has been saturated by fast food franchises. Um, so that for every healthy food outlet, for every green grocer or supermarket, there are nine unhealthy food outlets, nine fast food outlets. Wow. And they tend to, they tend to cluster around kindergartens, around primary schools and around secondary schools. So you can go and look at it on Google Earth or Google Maps. You see a kind of like clustering approach, a clustering phenomenon of these industries around these educational settings. And then on top of that, we have a you know very permissive advertising and marketing framework, and this is federal government now, where there's almost no controls on the ability of these industries to market those products and target children, um, you know, primary school children, school children, um, specifically with you know with marketing, and they spend billions of dollars, and they're you know um, very sophisticated, um, they know what they're doing um, in promoting these products. And then on top of that, you know, Melbourne, we're obsessed with sports. Australia's, you know, sports obsessed culture. And who are the biggest sponsors of, you know, AFL, the cricket? Mm. Um, you know, McDonald's. If you watch AFL, you know, it's um, McDonald's um, all the time. So, um, you know, these are messages that then become kind of, you know, embedded in, in the minds of, you know, young kids. Um, Absolutely. And, and it, all, it, all, it all contributes to... Um, you know this food swamp phenomenon and and this pandemic the other pandemic that we we don't talk about so much which is um, childhood obesity mm. um, you know that that you know the generation of our children my children are going to have a reduced life expectancy because of the food um, that they're eating which is you know pretty a shocking reversal of living standards in Australia and of course it's much worse for you know for First Nations communities and um, you know, uh, migrant communities in Australia as well. So, um, you know, these are the big problems of the food system. Mm. Um, sustainable food systems is about um, saying, you know, recognising those problems and saying we need to talk about this as a culture and as a society. Um, we need to become engaged. We need to become food literate. We need to educate ourselves about these challenges and problems. And then we need to be engaged and become active. We need to become food citizens and we need to say to our local government and our state government, look, this is not good enough that you've allowed um, our built environment and our land to be managed in this way and organised in this way that's producing these terrible outcomes that are you know, damaging our own health, damaging our children's health and damaging um, this country and its, and its ecosystems. Um, we need to do better, we can do better. We know what the answers are. Um, we know there's um, you know, thousands of Australian farmers and, and hundreds of thousands of farmers worldwide who are not embracing you know, large scale, destructive uh, industrial agriculture in the way I've described it, but are managing land sustainably, that are not putting you know, uh, toxic chemicals into soils and, and waterways, that are you know, working much more in harmony with nature educating themselves about the, um, you know, the, the ecology uh, that, they're, that they're in um, and seeing themselves not so much in a relationship of, you know, how can I kind of work this land as hard as I can to make, you know, money out of it in, you know, a five or ten year horizon, but much more from a kind of like an indigenous cosmology which sees uh, you as a farmer as a, in a relationship of stewardship or care with that land um, and the question is, how can I leave this, um, you know, this, this farm, this land in a better condition than what I found it and leave it as the basis um, for future food security and for, you know, future um, uh, abundance and flourishing for future generations of uh, land managers in Australia. I mean, that should be, I think, the, you know, the priority for agriculture in this country. And, you know, many farmers now are kind of like embracing that kind of paradigm shift, that mindset. And that should then translate across the whole food system. How can we organise our food system so that it optimises human health and well-being at every point, and um, and also optimises flourishing ecosystems and minimises um, harm? Yeah, um, those should be the priorities. Those should be the questions. So that's 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 sustainable food systems and food sovereignty kind of relates to that by saying that. Yep. Sorry, go on. 
I was going to say, just before you go on to that, it just seems like when you say all that, it just seems like a no-brainer. I mean, I my background is in health promotion. And so obviously that's an interest area of mine and I've studied, um, you know, stuff to do with that. So, it's you know, for me, it just seems no, a no-brainer. And obviously with your interest, it seems like a no-brainer. But I don't understand why for everyone else or for so many why the decisions have been made the other way. And I know the argument is the, um, is money. Um, but in the long term, where it's costing the states and the nation more money through illness mm. than it is yep. in the money that they're gaining in revenue through these um, franchises and, um, mark, you know, and big corporation setups. I don't, I don't. Well, get- that's, that's right. And, and yeah, it's absolutely common sense that we should be organising our food system and farming system in a way that, you know, is, is for long-term resilience and, and health and sustainability. I mean, that's just, you know, just, just obvious. Don't. How could you argue against that? But hmm. um, I think the reason that um, change is difficult is because there are, you know, there are vested interests, there are powerful interests that, that, that are benefiting from the current situation. And um, don't want to see it changed. Um, the same thing happened with the tobacco, you know, the argument about tobacco. I mean, it was, you know, obvious that tobacco was causing harm and that we should take measures to reduce consumption and, and um, free marketing of tobacco. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when it was it was Benson and Hedges that was sponsoring cricket in Australia. You know, it was the, it was the Benson and Hedges World Cup for, you know, for a long time until until we decided that, you know, that was no longer appropriate and we shouldn't be associating uh, sport and something that children participate in uh, en masse uh, with with a marketing opportunity for an obviously unhealthy product. Um, so I think, uh, but that was, you know, that wasn't easy. That took time. That took a lot of campaigning by public health, you know, um, promote, promotion um, uh, and, and, and public health campaigns. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of resistance, I guess, is what I'm saying. There's kind of like entrenched vested interests that are, that are benefiting from the status quo that don't want to see a change because, you know, uh, if farmers know how to manage their land and can restore fertility to soils through compost and through, you know, manure and through natural ecosystems, why would they need to go and spend tens of thousands a year on, you know, on, on fertilisers and chemicals? Um, if they can develop that ecological literacy and, and um, manage the land in that way, they're not going to need to, you know, um, be, be spending their money um, uh, with those corporations. So it's, you know, this is kind of powerful um, and liberating. And from an ecological perspective and a human health perspective, it's absolutely the right thing to do, but it's, it's threatening because it, it threatens, you know, the, the um, best interests of certain economic actors. So it becomes a political question. And that's where I was going to with food sovereignty. So food sovereignty is a, is a you know, a social movement, a food movement that has been initiated through the, you know, when I started talking about Guatemala, you know, the kinds of small scale farmers in countries like Guatemala, um, many of them women farmers, um, because, you know, the majority of small scale farmers in the world are women. Um, in, in discussion with each other across culture, across language, uh, across the world, um, identifying that they share interests in common, uh, which is growing food for their own communities um, to sustain themselves and to sustain their own ecosystems. And that's what they want to um, say that the food system should be about, and that food and agriculture should have those as the highest priorities. Um, and and so food sovereignty is the idea of a you know a democratic and inclusive and participatory uh, food system nationally and globally that prioritises uh, ecological integrity and human health and well-being, um, and that that should be uh, the focus of policies and and resourcing and research uh, more uh, and over and above the short-term profit interests of the large um, agribusiness and food retailing and manufacturing corporations that currently uh, are the major decision makers um, in the global food system. So, you know, that's that's the idea of food sovereignty. It's like, how can we empower ourselves, educate ourselves and work together uh, to make these important and necessary changes in our food and farming system? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And obviously then that, you know, brings it to a more fair system with, um, with more equity between you know different different levels of um 
I suppose, privilege of different people. You know, it closes the gap between between different socioeconomic classes. Mm, exactly. That's right. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, I mean, I, my as you said at the start. I mean, my my first degree was in law, and um, uh, I, my my PhD, you know, looked at um, human rights, and I was I was a human rights activist. But I, I identify as a human rights activist. I believe in the idea of universal human rights, and the idea of universal human rights is, um, you know, when it comes to food, mm. is that everybody should be entitled to have good food. Basically, yep. you have the food they need to be healthy. You know, every child on earth um, should have the food they need to develop their brain and their body and their organs in a healthy and complete way. Yeah. Um, and that, and as a as a species, um, humanity um, uh, can do that. Like, like, there's no reason why uh, nearly a billion people today are growing going hungry. You know, why we have tens of millions of children um, malnourished and, and, and stunted. Um, it's just, yeah, there's no it's reason for that. Um, yeah, that, that, that we can, you know, we can achieve that. There's no reason for anyone in Australia to be hungry. Like it's unacceptable. We're a rich country. Yeah. Um, we're more than capable of providing enough food, regard, and regardless of whoever you are or, you know, what your life circumstances are or how much money you've got. We are wealthy enough to, to distribute uh, our resources equitably so that everybody you know can eat well. Um, that's the idea of the human right to food, the universal human right to adequate food, and I would see that as like a you know basic foundational principle that should underpin you know all of our work on sustainable food systems, and certainly that's from where we come as sustain. That's a kind of like a an ethical commitment and principle that we have that guides our work in this area. Yeah, brilliant, Nick. You're doing oh, your your work's you know awesome, and I'd love you know I would have loved to have more time um, in this discussion for you to be able to share more about um, sustain and and the business. But I'll put a link to the website so people can check out in more detail what you do. But um, I think we've covered your goals and and um, and the main work that you're doing. Um, in the conversation so far. But what I'd love to talk now about is your latest project, which is kind of touched on it earlier when you talked about the um, the opportunity and the silver lining that this COVID time has given us and for people to realise that um, because of the lockdowns and because of the restrictions that they've, and the time that a lot of people have had, that they've you know, started growing edible gardens, you know, in their homes. And some of the, also, like you said, the health benefits that people are getting by just spending time in the garden. So you created in your latest project a survey called the Pandemic Gardening Survey. So I'm wondering if you can tell me and tell us all a little bit about what that is and why you put it together to start there and then we'll talk about maybe some of the findings. Sure. Um so yeah, the reason the reason for this, and this is kind of touches on what I was saying before about my own work as a Churchill Fellow and being interested in urban agriculture and its importance, um, uh, that we have been organising for the last few years a national urban agriculture forum where we're wanting to celebrate and acknowledge um, and demonstrate the importance of urban agriculture in Australia. So um, during the COVID uh, time, um, working with you know affiliated organisations such as Stephanie Alexander Kitchen Garden or um, Foundation, 3,000 Acres, uh, Community Gardens Australia, Sustainable Gardening Australia, uh, Pocket City Farms and others, Yerra Bingen, uh, we, uh, we decided to, um, you know, to try and investigate the, uh, how many people were actually growing some of their own food at this time and, and what it meant to them to be doing it during COVID and lockdown. Um, and that was kind of like, you know, there were a lot of reports, newspaper reports coming out about, you know, nurseries, Bunnings and so on, selling out of seeds and seedlings, and it seemed a lot of people were taking up sort of food gardening at this time. So we wanted to kind of like capture that and get a bit of a sense of the zeitgeist, I suppose, at this time, uh, as to you know what people were doing in their time at home uh, in the garden and you know what it meant to them. So that was the idea of the pandemic gardening survey, which we put out in mid June and let it go for about a month. And with the support of Costa Georgiadis of Gardening Australia and the Diggers Club um, and others, uh, we managed to get uh, over 9,000 responses, which was wow. pretty, you know, pretty phenomenal response. Um, and yeah, it really kind of like 
uh, demonstrated, um, you know, what, what we'd kind of intuited, um, but we now got kind of like, you know, facts and figures to kind of back all this up that, um, you know, people were spending a lot of time in the garden. A lot of people were spending a lot more time in the garden. People were growing a lot of food and a lot of people were growing a lot more food than normal because they had more time. Um, uh, that um, uh, that gardening mattered a great deal uh, for people, um, and I can actually give you. Um, I think um, uh, yeah, there's a particular question that we had about the importance of gardening uh, during the pandemic, like how much gardening uh, meant to you, and we gave people the choice. There were three, or there were four choices rather. So it was. Um, um, uh, that gardening is extremely important at this time. I couldn't have made it through without, without my garden, that it was very important. Being able to garden during this time has meant a great deal, that it was somewhat important. I like gardening, but it's not essential and not so important. I can take it or leave it. So over 80% of the 9,000 respondents um, said that garden was either extremely important, as in almost like a matter of survival. I couldn't have made it through without my garden. It was about 20% or about 1,600 people said that. And then uh, over 60% or over 5,300 people said it was very important to them that being able to garden at this time uh, meant, um, meant a great deal. Um, so I think I've uh, just got uh, a, little, um, uh, a little quote that um, I can give you on that. Um, if I can, sorry, I just have to... Uh, get to the um, actual presenting mode so I can actually read this uh, properly. Just bear with me for one second, Lisa. All right, so, um, uh, yeah, so here's uh, uh, somebody who started gardening since the COVID pandemic in Brisbane. Um, uh, she said, during March and April, I lost all of my work. It was a very anxious time, but the physical activity of setting up a few garden beds and resolving the issues of possum, bird and cabbage butterfly gave me a strong focus. Um, um, and then someone else, in uh, a lady in Woi Woi in New South Wales said, um, I live in a corner townhouse on my own. I grow as much as I can on my small pot and mostly things I can cook or preserve. Just being able to walk outside and pick what I need for my meal, my entire meal or just herbs or additions to supplement the meal has saved me from being around in markets or supermarkets. I have felt safer and healthier. Um, so we had, you know, um, hundreds of comments like that. Mm. And then in terms of like the mental health benefits, the psychological well-being that people derive from being in the garden, um, we had um, uh, comments like this um, that, uh, or, or rather the statistics in terms of 38% um, of respondents or over 3,300 people said um, that gardening uh, has a... Greatly, a great impact on mental health. It makes me feel much more relaxed, less stressed and anxious and happier. Uh, and then a further, just under 3,000 people, 2,975 or 34% of respondents um, said that the gar gardening had a significant impact on mental health. It makes me feel more relaxed, less stressed and anxious and happier. Um, so that's over 70% of respondents um, saying, you know, gardening has a you know, really significant impact uh, on their mental health and well-being. Um, so here's uh, somebody who identifies the low income, uh, from a low income household that's less than fifty thousand dollars a year as a household in Melbourne. Uh, lady aged between forty-five and fifty-four. Um, she's been growing food for over ten years, and she says. Gardening has grounded me and connected me to empowering myself in a particularly disempowering circumstance, it's given me an outlet for my creativity and calmed my mood as I've gotten used to letting go of my pre-COVID life. It's taken place of work hours and actually is more meaningful, this work with my mother earth. It's a deeply fulfilling and rewarding experience. Wow, beautiful. Um, How I mean, it must, must give you such joy to be reading through some of these responses. I mean, the impact that such a simple thing that our grandparents did so easily, um, you know, and people are starting to bring that way back. And, and I think that that's been one of the beautiful things about this COVID time is, and I wrote a post about it on my personal page actually yesterday or the day before about how 
it's sort of this feeling like we're bringing back the grandparents' lifestyle, obviously mm. the mm. aid of digital technology to be able to advance some of the things or connect in different ways, but, you know, back to the modern world. And it's, it's really beautiful. And some of those responses that you just read out are just so um, heartening. Mm, absolutely. Oh, look, I'll just share a couple of others with you. Um, uh, Cause I realize we've gone over our, um, over our hour. We could talk oh, right. for a long time. Um, but uh, yeah, somebody from uh, Tasmania, a lady from Tasmania says, it has kept me calm and focused on the future. There is a future when you garden. Yeah, amazing. That's so simple. Um, and another, another lady from New South Wales says, thank goodness for gardening. It brings me peace, happiness, comfort, generosity, connections, health, and nourishment. Um, so, yeah, there were just thousands of comments like that of people who said how much it meant to them and... Um, you know, the, the real um, importance of this. And, and somebody uh, from South Australia said in relation to us doing the survey, and this was very validating. Um, he said, I'm so glad that someone is recording this awakening. I feel that gardening keeps me in touch with the basics of our existence. Mm. It reminds me that the complexities of life can sometimes just require observation and interaction. Mm. It reminds me that the graciousness of life is abundant. These are qual these are qualities learnt in a garden. Mm. And uh, yeah, I just find those words really, you know, really touching, and um, you know, quite poetic and moving, really. Um, uh, and again, it kind of like, you know, it makes me really want to. Um, uh, again, so do what I can and in the position that we have and the platform that we have now with Sustain to, you know, to share those messages that so many thousands of Australians um, shared with us through this survey uh, to say to our, you know, our, um, the people who manage land, the people who have budgets to support this kind of work that say, look, this is, you know, this is such a powerful activity and, and so meaningful to so many Australians. Uh, so beneficial, so impactful in so many ways. Um, why can we not use this opportunity to, um, you know, to promote it, to expand it? Because, um, you know, it can just have so many flow and benefits, um, you know, not just now during the pandemic, but, you know, um, for years and decades to come. Absolutely. So is there, a, a, apart from just showing the, I suppose, compiling the reports of the results. Is there specific things that you aim to do to you to use the results for? Mm, absolutely. So, yeah, we've got a webinar. We've got a couple of webinars coming up. We will be sharing. Um, we're just, you know, it's, it's, as you can imagine, been a massive body of work to go through 9,000 um, completed responses and, and synthesise it into a, a presentation form and a report form, but that's what we've been doing over the last couple of months. So we'll be sharing that as a public webinar on the 16th of September. Great. I'll put, the, um, I'll put If you forward me the details of that, I'll put the details of that webinar in the show notes. And is that public? Yes, that's a public webinar. Yep. yep. So I'll just uh, I'll share that with you in the chat now, Lisa. Um, so you've got that. Um, uh, so yes, we'll be doing that, um, and that will be you know a kind of like a, a public webinar for everybody who's interested in this. Uh, that will be also featuring Costa Georgiadis of uh, Gardening Australia, who's been a, a major kind of champion um, uh, of this work. Uh, and then on the 9th of October, we'll be doing a follow-up webinar, which we're really focusing on the recommendations and the you know where to next and the the actions uh, and the implications that we see coming out of these. Um, these findings. So the, the 16th will be what did we find and what were the key themes and messages and the 9th will be, um, you know, for really for local government, state government, policy makers, um, uh, you know, over to you, like what are the, you know, what, what, what needs to happen in terms of actually, um, you know, supporting and resourcing and expanding this, uh, um, this area. So that would be, yeah, a, a webinar on the 9th um, yeah, both of people in government, but also people in community who are wanting to do the sorts of things that you said about um, getting access to land, being able to set up community gardens, what kind of support do they need, all that kind of stuff. So, 
Um, and then we'll be publishing a report. So after we've done the second webinar, we'll be publishing a report and we'll be taking that to um, every council. We'll send that to every council in Australia, all 700 or 650, whatever it is. And we'll also be sending it to every state government and to the federal government and saying, look, you know, this is, these are the voices of 9,000 Australians um, from every state and territory who've talked about, um, you know, just how much it's meant to them to be able to have access to this space uh, at this time and, and to be able to, um, you know, grow some of their own food. And this is a huge opportunity for you as a government to show leadership um, and support and help us, um, you know, come together as a, as a nation, as a community uh, and make some really positive changes. And it's not, you know, we're not talking about, you know, billion dollar infrastructure programs. We're talking about um, supporting people, connecting people um, in what they're already doing and what they want to do uh, and just creating the frameworks and, and some resourcing um, and some programs around it to really kind of ramp it up. So it's a, I think it's a huge opportunity and we'll be pushing that as hard as we can um, in all the different uh, places that we um, have access to. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. And I think it, it's such a good initiative and it is, if any silver lining can come out of this time that's been so difficult for people, um, for progress to happen in this area um, out, of, out of a situation like this and obviously out of your, um, in yours and your team's initiation to um, get this, this survey rolling and then be able to do something with it, then wow, that's that's a massive silver lining, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, uh, and this is all kind of like leading up to our third national urban agriculture forum, and I'll share the link with you now. The uaf.org.au um, website. And for the first time, we're going to be having a nationwide um, acknowledgement and celebration of all forms of urban agriculture across Australia in a urban agriculture month. So on our website, we'll be um, having a, a calendar and listing of events and anybody can jump on there and, and organise an activity, an event, a tour of their garden, a workshop, a, a podcast, a film showing, you know, a, a lunch, um, it, you know, whatever it might be that's kind of themed around um, uh, sustainable food systems and edible gardening. And we really want to like make that a really big, um, you know, focused uh, national um, series of events. Um, try and get, you know, 100, 500, 1,000 different activities happening around Australia, um, you know, to really shine a spotlight on this area and, and send that message strongly that um, this is something that uh, people really embrace and love and, and, and want to uh, acknowledge and, and to be supported in. So that's what we're doing in April, um, April next year. Oh, brilliant. I mean, very inspiring all the work that you do and it really is you know such an important um area of social change because like you said it all really stems down to you know life is what we eat and how important it is and the ripple effects that it has on so many in so many areas of um of our total well-being and in so many different groups actually everybody so and and our yep. environment so um yeah Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thanks. You know, so it's been so insightful and so inspirational chatting with you today. So, you know, I think in winding it up, is there anything further that you want to add? Um, no, thanks, Lisa. It's been really great to chat with you as well. And, and thanks very much for the opportunity. And um, yeah, I really hope it's been of interest uh, to your listeners and hopefully it's got some of them inspired to um, you know, continue what they're doing or new ideas about how they can, you know, get involved. Um, I'd just like to, yeah, really encourage people to, um, yeah, to think about uh, the food that, that you eat, to think about, you know, the implications of that, think about the broader connections, um, to realise that, you know, you can make changes, that we're all agents of change in our own lives and, and through our own kind of networks. You know, this is the time of connection and, and networks. Um, we're all powerful beings, you know, more powerful than we know. And I think it's the, it is the time to inhabit that power and to realise that, you know, all of us um, who are around today and are conscious of the, you know, the big crisis and challenges that we're facing have a responsibility to, to be active and, and to act and, and to do what we can within our capacities and relationships to, to be agents of change. Um, and yeah, just finally, um, if you if you you know feel moved at all or uh, by what I've said and, and the work that we're doing, you know, please support us by coming along to that webinar on the 16th. 
Um, and also, um, you know, we have, we're a membership-based organisation. Um, our voice and our work can become stronger if people join as a member of Sustain. So um, I'll just leave that link for you as well um, if people do want to get involved. Um, just uh, we have... Share that link now. I mean, I'll put it on the show notes as well, but do you want to just say what the, what the website link is? Yeah, sustain.org.au and, um, yeah, there's a section there about getting involved and uh, becoming a member. Um, and, yeah, we have categories of membership. Uh, you know, if you become a member, you have free access to all our webinars um, as well as other benefits. And we have a category of membership. It's uh, what we call solidarity membership. And that means that 10% of those memberships go towards the Pay the Rent initiative, which is um, giving back to our First Nations peoples in Australia and um, making a direct financial contribution to uh, the work they're doing in terms of reclaiming their, um, you know, their sovereignty and, and their culture and um, and their future. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, we'd, we'd um, you know, really uh, encourage people to consider that and, and would welcome, um, you know, uh, uh, people becoming involved as members of Sustain. Absolutely. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, I'll definitely put all the links on the show notes um, from different parts of the conversation as well as obviously the Sustain work, um, website as well as the link for the upcoming webinar so thank you again and if you um, love today's conversation please share it with your friends and subscribe to the wealthy living conversations on itunes and on youtube so that you can listen to more conversations from incredible humans that are doing fantastic things in this world if you, um, we'd love, both Nick and I would love to hear what your biggest insight or takeaway is from today's conversation. So please leave a comment and let us know. To find out a little bit more about my services, you can visit my website at wealthyliving.com.au or connect with me on any of my social media platforms. Until next time, remember, connection is medicine.